Listening test one. In the listening test, you'll hear a variety of people speaking and you'll have to answer questions on what you hear. There'll be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you'll have a chance to check your work after each section. You should play the recording right through without stopping. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers on the listening question pages. At the end of the real IELTS test, you'll be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers from the question booklet to an answer sheet. You should be prepared to do this with the practice test. Now turn to section 1 of listening to... You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a conversation between the head librarian and a student who wants to do voluntary work in the children's section of the library. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion, only the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning. You'd like to volunteer for the children's section, is that right? Yes. I spoke to you on the phone yesterday. That's right. Tessa, isn't it? Yes. Tessa Bridges. The applicant's name is Tessa Bridges. So Bridges has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Good morning. You'd like to volunteer for the children's section, is that right? Yes, I spoke to you on the phone yesterday. That's right. Tessa, isn't it? Yes, Tessa Bridges. Thank you for coming in today, Tessa. Before we discuss what a volunteer does in the library, I'll need to get some details from you. No problem. What would you like to know? Where do you live, Tessa? I still live with my family in Northwood, 51 Matthew Drive. M-A-T-H-E-W? Matthew Drive? Actually, there are two T's. M A double T H E W. Oh, thank you. And the postcode for Northwood is. Oh, I'm still confused about that. It used to be 2614, which of course I still remember, but the post office has recently changed it to 4126. So. 4126. Now, you're a university student, aren't you? Not exactly. I go to Northwood Polytechnic. I'm in my final year. In your final year? So what are you studying? I mean your main subject. Oh, I'm majoring in creative writing. And are you enjoying that? Very much so. I love it. When I graduate, I want to write children's books. That's great. Now, I can see why you're keen to volunteer at the library. We're always grateful for the extra help, but I still have to ask you some more questions about your previous experience. That's fine, but I haven't had a full-time paid job yet. Not to worry. Part-time work or voluntary work gives you the experience most employers are looking for. Well, to start with, when I was 16, I had a babysitting job. And who did you work for? Oh, just family friends. How long did you babysit for family friends? 
Oh, about two years, on and off. After those two years were up, what did you do then? Well, I was still working as a babysitter on the occasional evening and weekend when I became a peer tutor at school. I did that for one year, my last year at senior high. And what does being a peer tutor involve? Mostly, it means staying behind after school one or two afternoons a week to help fellow students in the subject that they're having difficulty with. And what subject did you tutor in? English, actually. I see. Do you have any other experience? I worked at the Ace Sports Academy as a tennis coach, but that was only for about 12 weeks over the summer before I enrolled at the Polytechnic. So you're good at sports? Not everything, just tennis. And are you currently working? Yes, well, unpaid work, that is. I'm a volunteer at the local hospital, where I visit sick children who would otherwise not have any visitors. Well, it certainly seems as if you like children. Yes, I do. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now, listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Well, Tessa, what I need to know now is what your schedule is like so that we can fit you into the roster here. Can I assume that you're not able to work Monday to Friday during office hours? Right. I'm very busy with lectures, workshops and assignments during the week. How about weeknights? Say five to seven in the evening. That's a very busy time in the children's section. Well, I couldn't commit to more than three evenings a week, and even then it would depend on my schedule. Yes, I understand. If possible, we could make arrangements a week in advance. Would that help? Yes, that might work. Are weekends OK? Well, Sundays are out. Actually, only every other Sunday, because that's when I'm usually needed at the hospital. But I'm free on Saturday afternoons. All right. We could roster you for the odd weekend, then. What about school holidays? Definitely. No problem whatsoever. I don't have any other commitments during the holidays. That's good to hear. We have droves of children here in the holidays, as you can imagine. Thank you. Well, Tessa, we'll send you a letter of appointment in the mail, and we look forward to having you join us as a volunteer. Thanks very much. Now, as for your duties. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now, turn to Section 2. Section 2. You will hear a radio advertisement for a health program. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Prevention is better than cure. You all know that, don't you? 
Have you been looking for some help and guidance for maintaining your health? Well, today I want to tell you all about a new health program called Be Well. Be Well Online, actually. This is an interactive website packed with resources to assist you in achieving your health goals. On this website, you'll find up-to-date health information you can trust. It has a register which includes a quick online check to assess your health and keep track of your progress. What do you want to do? Lose weight? Give up smoking? Manage your blood glucose levels, or just improve your overall fitness. Use the simple online assessment tool and receive a personalized report on your current state of health. This is what we call your wellness register. After you've completed this, you'll be ready to move on. Now, the active health agenda. Is where our team of experts has created a series of interactive eight-week programs for some of the most common health goals. These are aimed at differing ages and lifestyles, and include healthy eating and workout plans, plans for losing weight, stress management, longevity, or how to age gracefully by maintaining your health. And express workouts for those of you who never have enough time. If you join up to Be Well Online, you'll not only be able to use a whole suite of interactive tools and calculators, but you'll also have unlimited access to an extensive library of health articles, delicious simple recipes, and illustrated exercise descriptions. Let's look first at the active sport component. This gives you individual attention. In fact, it's a virtual personal trainer. Sports science and fitness experts have developed programs that will enable you to take on a specific sporting challenge or fitness goal adapted to your particular ambition and skill level. Detailed daily warm-ups and workout plans and weekly training schedules. Will help you prepare for any upcoming event of your choice: marathons, triathlons, open water swims, cycling, or fun runs. Are just some of the events you could enter with confidence when you've completed an active sport program. Be Well Online also features an active care project. This caters for individuals who want to address specific health needs. The four courses in most demand are stop smoking, which will give you strategies, email support, and reliable tools and resources to help you quit smoking forever. Then there is glucose management, a self-care program designed for people with high blood sugar, which will help you manage your condition and improve your overall health. Obviously, heart health has a large following. It's basically all about lifestyle modification, where you will take a course of action with the aim of improving your cardiovascular health. Those of you who suffer from neck and/or back pain will benefit from the back care program, but we're talking about minor troubles here. Anything major should be attended to by a qualified physician in person. So, what are you waiting for? Register today at bewellforlife. dot com. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions eighteen to twenty. Okay, I can hear some of you saying that you don't have enough willpower to go through with our online program. Well, just for people like you, we offer Be Well Coaching. What is it? It's a telephone-based service that will give you the extra support, motivation, 
and techniques that will provide the impetus for you to bring about permanent changes. Who runs it? The course is delivered by experienced health coaches, as well as qualified exercise physiologists, dietitians, and nurses. Who can use it? Well, this service is really for those of you who have serious health concerns like diabetes, arthritis, or high blood pressure. I know there are many of you out there who could benefit from this. How does it work? Your health coach will provide assistance as you develop a plan and maintain regular contact over a period of six months to help you stay on track. You'll also get access to a phone-in service for extra support if you need it, and you'll be provided with health information specifically targeted at your individual problem. Now, what could be better than that? That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear a conversation between two senior students who have to organize a competition for the University Open Day. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hi, Grant. What sort of competition do you think we should organize? Well, Claire, the Open Day Committee was pretty clear on that. It must be something with youth appeal. That makes sense. After all, most of the visitors will have just left high school. Yeah, so I was thinking technology. Do you mean something which uses the latest technology, like an iPod? Something like that, but a bit more expensive, maybe. What about the latest iPhone? I'm saving up for one right now. Let's make it an iPad. I wish I'd had a tablet computer when I started university. Yeah, that's a great idea. That should get a lot of our younger visitors interested. Right. Let's go with that, then. Fine. We could go into town now and buy it. I saw great deals advertised at the Rick Smith store. Oh, I don't think we'll have to worry about that. A university purchase order will probably be arranged through the resources and supplies section. Well, that's settled, then. What about the competition? Is it going to be a game of skill or a guessing game? Or something else. What do you think would work best? Good question. I don't think it should be anything too hard, or anything that will make the visitors look silly. Some of them have such fragile egos. True. So, something that anyone can do. Nothing competitive, no skill or intelligence involved. That's right. But the main thing is that the contestants have a lot of fun. How do we do that? Well, I was thinking of a popular TV series, science fiction or science fantasy. I don't actually know the difference. Go on. It's a series where in every episode, the main characters step through a portal into another world or another era. What's a portal? It's like a gateway or entrance to something. Okay, I get it. They'll be stepping into the new world of tertiary learning. So somehow we encourage people to step through this portal. Then what? They get their photo taken. Is that all? Not exactly. Let me think. 
I can't see how that's a competition, unless we pick the best photograph. But there's not much excitement or involvement in that for the participants. Hmm. Wait. We don't decide on the winner. I mean, no one person does. We get them, the public, to do it. How? Put all the photos on Facebook, and the one with the most votes wins. I agree. Good idea. But there's just one more thing I'm not clear about. How do we get hold of a portal? I was thinking graduates of the engineering department could construct it as part of their contribution to Open Day. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now, listen and answer questions 28 to 30. How do visitors enter the competition on Open Day? Well, firstly, they have to make their way to the portal photo booth on campus. Okay. A bit like a treasure hunt to start with. Yes. And then they get their photo taken stepping through the portal. And they'll have to write down their details. You know, name, phone number, email. No, hang on. Let's keep it simple. Just name and email address should do. Then, after, say, the 30th of July, people can visit the university Facebook page and vote for their favorite photo. So the photo with the most votes wins. Yes. I think that should generate quite a bit of interest. What about a cutoff date? Of course. Maybe, um... The most popular photo as of 5 p.m. on the 10th of August will collect the iPad. And the winner will be notified by email. And the winning photo will be enlarged and published in full color on the University Facebook page. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk given by a lecturer in the Environmental Studies Department on Agriculture and Environment. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to this lecture on agriculture and the environment. I hope it is enough to make some of you decide on a career in the field of agricultural science. As you all know, food is a basic human need, and producing enough of it is the single greatest challenge facing the modern world. Developing nations have rapidly expanding populations, so agriculture should be central to any development agenda for those countries. What's more, 75% of people in the developing world are dependent, directly or indirectly, on agriculture for their livelihood. And for many low-income countries, it's the most important sector of the economy, accounting for 50% of GDP and sometimes it's the primary, if not only, source of foreign currency. Now, of course, when I talk about agriculture, I am using the term to encompass more than just growing food crops. Of course, 
livestock farming, fishing, and forestry are included. In order to combat wide-scale food shortages, agricultural research programs are underway in many areas. Using science is one way to increase productivity. But a word of warning: agriculture must also be sustainable. Let's look at approaches that are not sustainable. Firstly, overgrazing and intensive cropping are two ancient but destructive practices that lead to loss of soil fertility. Secondly, the modern idea of liberal application of chemical pesticides and herbicides has had disastrous consequences for the health of the land, ranging from the pollution of water sources to the destruction of wildlife. These practices have ignored the mechanisms that sustain ecological communities. Ignorance has led to the destruction of the very biodiversity that is essential for sustainable food production. However, introducing new agricultural techniques, especially things like genetic engineering, can be difficult because many people remain suspicious of the fact. That plants have had their genetic material modified by scientists. Biotechnology has also led to the dubious practice of bioprospecting, or, as some prefer to call it, biopiracy. Foreign multinational companies have been accused of illegally obtaining samples of indigenous plants of other countries in order to get their hands on genetic material. To improve the quality or yield of their own crops, we must put aside the controversy surrounding the field of agricultural biotechnology in order to concentrate on the biggest threat to food production on this planet, which is, yes, climate change. The effects of global warming so far have been to shrink the food supply, thereby pushing up prices and making. Even the most basic necessities unaffordable. As I see it, the international community must address this and other challenges to agricultural production with urgency. Concrete scientific and technological achievements need to be presented for farmers to evaluate and learn to use. But apart from that, governments need to address the complex issues of policy development. If the world's hungry are to be fed, environmental policies need to be put in place to protect ecosystems and correct soil degradation where possible. Countries cannot continue to exploit natural resources whilst ignoring the consequences. In fact, I'd like to see teams of agriculture and environment experts making up a global network which would monitor the world's farming systems. Different farming systems should be studied not only with a view to analyzing the environmental effects, but the social and economic effects as well. The studies would be carried out with a view to stemming pollution and erosion and promoting safe, cost-effective practices that will guarantee a secure food supply in the future. Monitoring sites would need to be set up all across the world. And data collected in a systematic way. Of course, building the online infrastructure for such a project would cost millions of dollars, and there would be ongoing costs involved with the monitoring system. But the information gathered would go a long way towards solving the problem of feeding the masses and ensuring millions of people don't face a hungry future. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.